Turn back a couple hundred to one that we're pretty familiar with, but let those words just soak in. It's beautiful. So just put your trust in Him, not in things of this world, not in people, not in chariots, and in Christ our Savior. And you got some harmony in your pocket? Bring it out. Praise Him.
Have a seat, guys. <clears throat> Y'all made it. So, praise God for that. Amen? Some of us didn't. Some of us didn't. A little... I'll fix it in just a second. I'm working on it. Some of us didn't make it because, you know, it's cold. It's, it's uh, slippery and all that. But you guys did. So, uh, I'm proud of y'all. And for those who join us online, I'm proud of you, too. Thanks for joining us. Um, but if you're here for the first time and the first time in a long time, in front of you, you'll find a little yellow card that says welcome on it. And we ask you to fill that out with as much information as you're comfortable with. And then uh, in just a few minutes, we'll have our welcome in which uh, you'll have time that you can go back and uh, hand it to Kathleen at the welcome station. And she'll give you a gift just for choosing to worship with us today. And the other thing that we want to give you is we want you to have a copy of God's Word. That you can read and understand. So also in front of you, you'll see a blue Bible. And if you don't have a Bible, if you don't have one with you today or whatever, if you need a Bible, take that one. In just a little bit when I do the sermon, when I give the sermon, um, I'll be preaching out of that same blue Bible. So I'll make page references so that you can follow along real easily and all that. So um, we want you to to be able to follow along in God's Word, and we want you to have uh, God's Word so that you can take it home with you. So that one belongs to you. Take it home. we got plenty of them in the back, and uh, we'll replace that one next week. Uh, last week, they were supposed to have a women's dinner on Thursday. didn't happen because of the weather and uh, some, some miscommunication from Bob Evans. But anyway, they told, they told Barb there was like two inches of snow on the ground out there, and they had to shovel the snow. And I'm, I'm literally... You know, I can throw a rock and hit Bob Evans, and I'm looking out, and there's nothing. And anyway, so they rescheduled it for this Thursday. So if you uh, were signed up for the women's event on last Thursday, you can sign up still and get involved in it on this Thursday. Uh, they're going to have Bob Evans, uh, dinner over at Bob Evans, but they need to know how many to reserve seats for. So if you're coming, please let Barb know there's a sign-up sheet in the back. I think it's still back there, and uh, it'll be a good time. Six o'clock is the time. Six o'clock, just having dinner, nothing, nothing too crazy, so it'll be cool. Uh, on February 4th, um, after the service, down in the fellowship hall, old school style, uh, because the wrestlers got all the mats over there and everything, I'm not going to bother them. We're going to have a, a sprinkle and what we call, we, we, we call shower sprinkles here, and the reason we do is because men don't go to showers. Just so you all know, I know you're like, oh, it's 2024, I don't care what year it is. Men don't go to showers. I don't go to bridal showers. I don't go to baby showers. I don't go to showers. I take a shower, but I don't go to showers. That's for women. So for what we do here, we call baby sprinkle. And no, we're not talking about baptism, just so you all know. It's literally just a baby shower that we all come to. We have some finger foods and, uh, and have a good time. But uh, Mary and, uh, and Brian are having a baby. Uh, they're due next month like pretty soon like the 21st of next month you know what you're having little girl so they're having little girl so buy stuff for a little girl uh and i'll tell you diapers never go wrong with diapers i know that when we had like titus and paxton you know and josie we didn't have to we didn't have to buy 
diapers for like the first six months because the church was so gracious. So let's be that gracious to them and, and shower them with gifts at the sprinkle. Anyway, that's happening on the 4th. Um, if you would like to help decorate for that, we need people for the decorating team. We need people for all the teams. There, you can sign up for that at the Next Steps table. Um, small groups are coming back next uh, month. Um, on February 6th and 7th, on the 6th, is going to be our, our first uh, women's ladies group in a while. So if you are a lady, um, there will be child care available for that. It's going to start at 630. There's an informational uh, pamphlet out in the lobby that you can get to let you know about it. Um, but that will be on Tuesdays, uh, beginning February 6th. And then our men's group will start on February 7th, which means we'll, we will no longer have Wednesday night service. So Wednesday night service will be moved um, to the different um, Bible studies group. On February 25th, we're going to have our Let Love Grow luncheon, and uh, that will be in the barn. It will be a good time. And make sure that if you are a teenager uh, grades 6 through 12th, um, you come tonight at 6 o'clock for our youth group. All right? Man, y'all are quiet. Everybody tired? Nervous? Okay. What are you nervous about? <laughs> I'm nervous that the heat keeps working. But uh, I think we're going to be all right today. I like it just a little cool, and today it's just a little cool. And I apologize for those who like it really warm. So it might be harder to fall asleep while I'm preaching. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I would ask you to remember uh, some folks in prayer. Remember Debbie Downing and uh, Michelle Kidder and my Aunt Kathy. Is, she's getting ready to have her scan results next month. Uh, to see how the treatment went for the cancer and all that kind of stuff. I ask you remember uh, Keegan Kirby, he broke his collarbone at work. He and I just don't mix. Some of y'all remember when he tried to go to the skating party, broke his knee, now he's broke his collarbone, so be in prayer for him. And uh, any other prayer requests that, uh, yes. Okay, we certainly will. Yeah, Jake. Yeah, you got it. Anyone else? Prayer request? Yeah, Kim or Kelly? I don't know why I just said that. You got it. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Josephine? And I'm telling you, if you mention a horse, I'm throwing you out of here. No, I'm just kidding. She always wants a horse. She wants to pray for a horse. Okay. Pray for Marty. Marty is her teacher's grandma-in-law. Yeah. Okay. So we'll pray for Marty too. All right. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer real quick, and then we'll we'll begin our time of welcome. Heavenly Father, I thank you for um, I thank you for for kids' prayer requests and and for a church that is willing to hear them. Because Lord, we know that you're willing to hear them. And so, Lord, we thank you for that, and we lift up our prayer request to you. Um, Lord, I pray that you, you continue to be with Debbie, and uh, Lord, we pray that you heal her and with Michelle and with Kathy. Lord, I pray that, um, that you be with Keegan as his arm, uh, you know, his collarbone needs mended, Lord, and I pray that uh, while you're doing that, that, that you can keep him still long enough to get it healed. Lord, I pray that, uh, that for, for the uh, Marty and for... Uh, Close grandma, Lord, and, and for Tim. And, uh, Lord, we just pray that each one of those cases that you touch them. And for Kelly's mom, Lord, that you just touch them, that you'd heal them. And uh, we, we, we give you praise in the midst of it. But we pray that you touch them and, and do your thing because you are the great physician. Your word says that you've numbered every hair on their head. And we thank you for that. And we ask these in Jesus' name. Amen. Take two minutes to say good morning to somebody. Shake their hand, give them, a, give them a hug. If you're not into that kind of thing, just stay seated and nobody will bother you except to say good morning.
right, Penny Royalers, come on, back to your seats. Let's raise the roof with these songs of praise and worship. You've heard it a dozen times, so sing it out. You know it. Who am I that you are mindful of me? That you hear me when I call. And is it true that you are thinking of me? That you love me? It's amazing. It's amazing. Three more times, let it build. been with you guys. Man, that was good.
We almost got 50-50 kids to adults today. <laughs> I'll take it. You want to find a dying church, look for one with no kids. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 9, page 903 in the Blue Bible. Matthew chapter 9. Let's go, Lord, in prayer, and then we'll get started. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for being able to come into this heated house of comfort to lift our voices and worship you, Lord. And as we transition to this next part, we pray that we worship you with our attentiveness to your word, that we worship you with our willingness to be transformed into your image by your spirit through the power of your word. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would just have your way with us during this time and that you would just use my voice box to relay your message. Lord, I pray for those who are here who are hurting. I lift them up to you, the ones who feel alone. And I pray, Lord, that they understand that it's not an accident that they're here today, but it's, it's because of the drawing of your spirit. So, Lord, continue to draw them. Open their hearts to your word today. And, Lord, for us who have been following you for a long time, Lord, I pray that you would remind us of the truths that we've known. Show us in your word the things we've missed. Forgive us where we have failed you and shape us into who you'd have us to be. We ask this in the name above all names with thanksgiving, Jesus. Amen. Matthew chapter 9 is where we are at today. And for those of you who are here for the first time or first time in a long time, maybe you missed out a little bit, uh, we'll just kind of catch up as to what we're doing. And that is uh, we're going through the life of our Lord Jesus. And we're trying to do it chronologically through the Bible. And if you're not familiar with the Bible, it's not necessarily written chronologically. It's not given to us or packaged for us chronologically. So we're trying to do this in a manner that is chronological. So in other words, one event follows the next event, which follows another event, you know, and all that kind of thing. So we're trying to go kind of straight through and glean all we can from what Jesus says, what he does, and what he teaches, you know what I mean? So, and what he preaches, you know, those are the, the, the three things that you always got to pay attention to when it comes to Jesus are not only um, what he's doing, but what is he teaching and what is he preaching, right? So, we're trying to p pick that up and apply it to our lives, let God use that in our lives, um, because the bottom line is, what I have to say today that is of Josh Clifford, you know, because I sometimes when I give sermons, I tell little anecdotes or I tell you little stories about my life, you know, things like that. None of that really matters. What really matters is what God says. So don't let, you know, my personality distract you from what God has for you today. Because bottom line is, you know, some people like me, some people hate me. But I don't care what you do with me. I don't care what you do with me. Because whether you like me or hate me or whatever won't get you into heaven. What you do with Jesus is what matters. So look past me and try to see him uh, today, especially through his word. We're, gonna, we're only going to be in chapter 9 for about uh, a few verses. Um, and we're going to begin in verse 35. I got this backwards and it drives me nuts when I don't have things the way that I want them. There we go. All right, it says, chapter 9 and verse 35 on page 903. On the, about the middle on the right, it says, And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. 
Now, if you've been following along, if you've been part of this uh, series, if you want to call it that, uh, this, this, I don't have a better word for it, I guess, uh, series works, um, whatever, this teaching, you know, going through the chronological life of Jesus, then you know that the last thing that happened was he proclaimed who he was in front of, uh, you know, the people, the, the opposition that was against him. And he gave his witness, his, his, his witnesses, his account of who, besides his own word, are testifying as to who he is. And he gave those four witnesses. And if you were here last week, you remember that they were uh, John the Baptist, his work, you know, the miracles that he did, God the Father himself attest to him, and the scriptures, that those are the four witnesses that, that expressed who Jesus really is. And so after he does that, he comes and he starts ratcheting up his ministry. Because if you've been following along, you would know, and I'm, I'm saying that to remind us who have been following along and to inform the ones who haven't been here. Uh, Jesus and his ministry, like, it's kind of one of those things where he started out and he was going to, like, place to place, and he would heal a few people, right? And then we got some stories where, like, one time he goes to this pool where everybody there wants healing, and he heals one guy out of the whole, out of the whole crowd that's there. And so we have these like sporadic healings. It's not really sporadic because he has a plan. He knows exactly what he's doing. He's God. Amen? But it's like individual healing here, individual healing there, that kind of a thing. But after he proclaims who he is and gives his witness of who he is, he ratchets it up a little bit. What does it say here? It says that he's visiting towns. He's healing everybody. Everybody, now that, he, now that he's given his testimony as to who he is, and the witnesses have, have, have borne out who he is, now it's stepped up a notch. He's healing everybody that comes. I want to tell you that that's probably, you know, when we hear this, when I read this, you know, I think about the fact that Jesus is God, but you have to remember he's man. Amen? I just imagine all these people coming and how exhausting it would be, you know, on the physical body. You know, healing all these people. And so he says, listen, look, look at all this. He's like telling the disciples, look at this. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. The first thing that I want you to see in this, and it's, it's, it's beautifully obvious, and that is that Jesus is full of compassion. Jesus is full of compassion. Look what it says. It says, and Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. This is an uptick or a ratcheting up of the ministry. He's healing few people here and there now he's healing everybody and when he mentions this it tells us about Jesus's threefold ministry and I want to point that out to you that there are three aspects to Jesus's ministry here that he mentions first of all it says that he was teaching where is he teaching at in the synagogues so he's like literally going into the 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 the, the mouth of the lion so to speak because that's where his opposition are that's where the Pharisees are that's where the religious elites are that are rejecting him the ones that he just proclaimed who he is to and all that. So he goes in the synagogues and he's teaching, and that's the first aspect of his ministry. I'm not saying that it's the most important, but it's the first one listed. Then after that, it said that he proclaimed the gospel of the kingdom. There's another word for pro proclaiming the gospel, and that word is preaching. Amen? So Jesus was not only teaching, he was also preaching. And there's a distinction between the two, and I went over that a few weeks ago, and that is that when you're teaching, the goal is information transfer, right? I have information I want you to have in order for me, for you to have it, I teach it to you. That's the goal, for you to get what I'm throwing down. Amen? The goal of preaching is something different. Preaching, the goal is transformation. The goal is to move you from where you are to where you ought to be, from where you are to where you belong. And so when Jesus is proclaiming this gospel of the kingdom, some of you may not even know what that phrase means. I want to tell you. Here's what it means. He's telling them that there is available to them forgiveness for their sin. Every one of you have walked in here, every one that has darkened the doors of Penny Royal Baptist Church throughout its history is a sinner. Amen? Every one of us, 
Every one of us has fallen short of the glory of God. Every single one of us has sinned against God, and that includes you. You may not think so. That's fine. You don't have, I mean, what I always say is, if you can prove to me that you're perfect, we'll take the cross down, put your picture up. Amen? Because there's only one, and it's him. It ain't you. And that sin, and whatever you thought of when I said your sin, I guarantee you something popped into each one of your minds. Did mine. Right? Tell me I'm lying. Tell me I'm wrong. That's right. When I said your sin, you thought about your sin. That's the way it is. Because you know you're a sinner. I don't have to tell you. Right? You know you are. You've done things wrong against God. If we just go through the big ten, right, the big ten, when we talk about don't have any gods before me, guilty. There have been plenty of times in my life that I put other things before God, right? And that was my God, right? Don't take my name in vain. I've done that before. You're like, you're probably sitting here and you may, you may be like one of those holier than thou types and you're like, well, I've never said GD. That's not, that's, not all that, that's not all it's talking about when it talks about taking his name in vain. Anytime you use God's name for your purposes, you're taking his name in vain. Right? Vanity. Focused on you. You see what I mean? Guilty. I've done that for sure. How about keeping the Sabbath day holy? You done that? Right? How about having graven images? Right? You're like, well, I don't have any, like, statues at my house. No, but you probably got TV. Has that ever been, has that ever been your God? Has that ever been the thing that you put in front of God? How about your Xbox? Guilty. Hey, I'm, I'm a gamer from way back. I'm just letting you all know. Right? Guilty. If we talk about the next six, those first four have everything to do with your relationship with God. And out of the first four, I guarantee you, you're probably guilty of all four of them. Which means you're a sinner. Not even talking about the next six. The next six have to do with your relationship with one another. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's wife. You know, not, not, not commit adultery. Don't cover, covet other people's stuff. Obey your mom and dad. Honor your mom and dad. You know what I'm saying? You want to tell me that you're blameless and all that? You're like, well, I've never killed anybody. Jesus addressed that already, amen? He said, if, you're, if you've been mad with your brother, if you've been angry with your brother, then you've been guilty of that too. So when Jesus comes along and he's teaching, he's teaching them about who he is, the fact that he is the Messiah, that he is the one that's prophesied about years, decades, millennia before he ever showed up on the scene. You know, in the, in the manger, he was prophesied about, and he's like, I'm him, and I've, I can prove it, and I'm going to prove it by these witnesses. And he, and he does all these big, huge, amazing, miraculous works. You know anybody else that can tell a storm to stop, and it does? I know that there's some TV preachers that claim to, but that and a buck 50 might get you a cup of coffee. They can claim all they want to, amen? Name it and claim it. Garbage. Garbage. Power of positive thinking. Garbage. Listen, it's all Jesus, right? So he comes and he's teaching that, that about who he is, but then he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And the gospel of the kingdom says that if you repent of your sin, you can be forgiven of your sin. If you repent of your sin, you can be, you're like, whoa, dude, you used a word that I don't even know, repent. Thank you for stopping me. Because I want you to understand, amen, the most important thing that you're going to find at Penarol Baptist Church today is the gospel of the kingdom. The most important thing. If you repent of your sin, in other words, there's, there's, two, there's two kind of uh, contexts that you can put this in. You can put it in the Greek context, and uh, that context is that you change your mind about the thing, right? So if you think about your sin, and some of it, I guarantee, you know, the Bible tells us the sin's enjoyable for a time. And there, there's, there was times in my life where I thought I was having all kinds of fun. There's times, there's times now that I look back on times that I were sinning sometimes fondly. You know what I mean? Anybody else? Anybody else willing to be that honest? Amen. That's right. Right. We have fun. 
right? But then when we see the sin, like God sees the sin, it changes the whole perspective about the sin. Because I'm going to tell you, there's not enough fun to be had in sin to, to make me want to keep him on the cross. And that's why he went there. Amen? To pay for that sin, right? I haven't even gotten into my notes. It's going to be a long day. But that's it. The, the gospel of the kingdom is that if you repent, if you change your mind about the sin, see the sin how God sees it. And then the Hebrew context is to turn away from, to turn away from the sin. Change your mind about it and turn away from it. If you're willing to do that, if you're willing to give that sin to Jesus, he paid for it. He paid the penalty because the Bible tells us that the wages of sin, the penalty for sin is death. And when it talks about this harvest, there's a guaranteed harvest for all of us. There's a harvest to judgment and death, or there's a harvest to salvation. You see what I'm saying? He's the, he's the God of the harvest, and the harvest is coming. Remember, we covered that a few weeks ago. Everybody's going to be raised, but raised to what? Right? Raised to what? Are you going to be raised to judgment and hell? It's a real place. It's not like it's not like a boogeyman under the bed, you know, the, you know, that that God uses to scare people with. It's where you're already headed apart from God. And it's a place that's separate from God. That's separated from God for eternity. And when you think about that, it's really not a place that I want to be. If I'm being honest. And I'm not, you know, everybody makes a big hullabaloo about the fire and all that kind of stuff. That's not even the part that makes me nervous. That's not even the part that, to me, really touches my soul, my core. The part to me is that God is love. And if you are apart from him, you are apart from love. Every ounce of it. How much, how much, think about this for just a second. Would friendship exist apart from love? No. But it even goes deeper. Would anybody even say, how's your day? Apart from love. No, people think that the opposite of love is hatred. It's not. It's indifference. That's the opposite. Imagine a place in which you're totally, utterly, completely separated from love. You can't because we experience so much of it here by his grace. Because here we have the presence of God. Amen? And so you can be raised to that because when you're stuck in the balance and on one side is your sin and on the other side is God's standard, if you don't trust Jesus, you got to pay for that sin. Amen? But the gospel is that because of Jesus, you can be forgiven of your sin. Because he took the, the, the sin, your sin, put it on his own shoulders, died for it on the cross even though he had never sinned. He died for your sin to pay for it as a payment for it. Right? That's the reason why we say he ransomed us. Yeah, he paid the payment so that we could get out of hell. You see what I'm saying? He ransomed us. And he could do the same thing for you if you surrender your life over to him. Just give him your life. Amen? Think about your life. Is it that special that you want to keep it? I mean, think about the turmoil and the trial and the struggle and all that kind of stuff. Think about all that, all the sin, all the problems that you have in your life. You want to hold on to that? For what? You can give it to him. You can give it to him and be forgiven. See, that's preaching. That's saying here's where you are, but here's where you belong. And that's the invitation. So that's the first part of Jesus' ministry is he went in teaching in the synagogue. The second part is that he went and he preached. He proclaimed the kingdom of God. Third part, healing. He healed folks of what ailed them, Right? That's the third part, the work, the action. And so this threefold ministry, you know, when he's, he's doing it, the crowds are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. You know what I mean? And he doesn't push him away. Praise God. 
Amen? Instead, he heals them all. Every one of them. You got problems? You know what I'm saying? You got, you, you, your back hurts? Boom, fix that. You come in without one leg, he'll fix that. Nothing's off limits to God. Amen? You never walked in your life? We can fix that. God takes care of it. Right? Blind dude, been blind his whole life, doesn't matter. God fixed that. Jesus healed them all. And so the crowd started getting bigger and bigger and bigger, as you can imagine. Amen? I'm telling you right now, if downtown Franklin, Ohio, next to Pisa Nello's, some dude was sitting there healing everybody, I would show up to get my back fixed. You know what I mean? I'm in so much pain right now, I can't hardly see straight. I'd be thankful for it, too. And as the crowds gather, here's something that always happens. When the crowds gather, the wolves circle. The wolves circle. They gather, too. And that's what's happening here. The Pharisees and their ilk are preying on the folks that are, that, that are gathering around to be a part of Jesus' ministry, to take part in it. Here's the cool part about it. When the wolves circle, Jesus sees it, he knows it, he cares about it. Amen? Isn't that what it says? Look, let's read it again because I've been talking for a while. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. In other words, the wolves were circling and they didn't have any defense against it. And he sees it and he knows it and he cares about it. Amen. I'm thankful for, for him caring about it. I'm thankful for his compassion because he has compassion for his people. In other words, if it, it gives me hope that when the wolves are circling me, and, you know, the, the Bible says that the devil is like a lion seeking who he, can, he, he may devour. I always use the example to let people know, and if you've heard it once, you've heard it a thousand times, but I'm going to give it to you again, amen? And that is, I know how lions hunt. I watched Discovery Channel when I was a kid. Do you ever watch that? And lions are something else. And what they do is they find the herd, right? The crowd. See what I'm saying? They find the crowd, the wildebeest. You know what I'm saying? You guys seen Lion King. What do they do? They get them running. Right? They get them running. Once they start running, then the lions can easily identify who are the weak. Who are the sick? Who are the feeble? Who are the old? Who are the lame? Who are the, you know? And they take those, anyone that they can find lagging behind, they, they quarantine them off and get them off by themselves. And then they feast. Right? If the devil's like a lion seeking whom he can devour, then he's going to come to the crowd and try to single out folks. If you Listen, you're part of the crowd today, and the devil might be trying to single you out. He might be trying to get you away from the crowd so that he can devour you. I'm going to tell you, don't, don't let him. You know what I'm saying? If you belong to Jesus, if you've given your life to Christ, he'll never leave you or forsake you, which means there is never a time in which the devil can get you alone and devour you because I'm never alone when I got Jesus, right? You're never alone when you have Christ. But the first thing I want you to see is that Jesus is full of compassion. It's part of his character. It's part of who he is. He loves us. The second thing that I want you to see is his call for more laborers. Jesus knew that their spiritual needs were greater than their physical needs. Amen? What good does it, would it do anybody, like if you come in with a broken arm to heal your broken arm and let you go to hell? Right? Everybody talks, everybody makes a big deal about feeding the homeless and all that kind of stuff. That's fine. They need to be fed, amen? But what good does it do them to go to hell on a full stomach? The gospel is the purpose, amen? That's the purpose. Sometimes you feed people, they're more, they're more willing to listen to the gospel. But the gospel is the purpose. Their, their spiritual needs were greater than their physical needs. He saw that, and more laborers were needed, the gospel moves people's souls from the harvest of judgment to, or from the harvest of judgment and damnation to the harvest of salvation. So that's the thing that needs tended to. Amen? 
That's the thing that needs laborers, right? So he says, therefore, pray earnestly. Therefore, pray. If you could just underline that. Therefore, pray. Jesus is telling other people to pray. I mean, think about that for a second. He's talking to the disciples. It's, if it was me, if I was Peter, I'd be like, I'm already, I'm, already, I'm already talking to you. You know what I mean? Because we think that prayer is just talking to God. It's not just talking to God, right? And Jesus proves it right here. Prayer is actively taking part in the fulfillment of God's plan. Isn't that what they're doing? You guys with me? Was that a bridge too far? Do I need to backtrack? I'll kick that dead horse two or three more times just to make sure everybody gets it. Look, look at what it says. Hold on. Let's look. It says, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Is the Lord going to prepare har uh, laborers for the harvest? Is he going to send them? Yes, right? We know that he does because we know the rest of the book. For some of you, y'all you don't, don't. You get a pass on saying amen. I get You get a pass. But those of you who know, then you don't get a pass, right? You should agree with that. This ain't a spectator sport. You're participating. And when you pray, you are participating in the fulfillment of God's plan. If you're praying within his will. Amen? So if you spend your time, Lord, I could really use a Ferrari. I'm going to pray for that earnestly. That doesn't mean he's going to give it to you. Amen? Right? Now, listen, I'm going to be honest with you. There's no harm in asking. He answers every prayer. But so far, I've been praying for that for 13 years, and I still got an old Suburban. So the answer is no, you know, and that's okay, right? You can ask whatever you want, but when you're in God's will, then the things that are like that, the trivial things, that doesn't really matter. I don't really pray for a Ferrari. I'm just letting you all know. It was just a joke, right? But what I do pray for is for people to come to Christ. And when I pray for people to come to Christ, they do because that's part of God's will. Amen? That's a prayer that's within God's will. So he, he's going to fulfill it. As a matter of fact, he does so in the very next chapter, which we're going to next. But don't read ahead, you overachievers. He says, therefore, pray for the Lord to send laborers, the Lord of the harvest, and when we pray, we actively participate in the fulfillment of God's plan. And Jesus just proved it right there. Think about that for just a second, though. Because if you have the proper perspective of who God is and who you are, that is very humbling. Amen? Here's the thing. God doesn't need me to fulfill his plan. Amen? Amen? but I get to participate. He allows me to participate in it. God, the God of the universe, the one that spoke and planets came about, stars, the sun, that God, almighty. You know, like there's no, there's no next level. There's no higher up on the food chain. That's it, it's God. Loves you and has compassion on you. And he loves you so much that he actually allows you to participate in his plan. Praise God for that. There are some celebrities that some of you all follow that literally you would give your left arm to meet that literally do not care if they ever meet you. They don't care a thing about it. And if you did meet them, they're not going to ask you to help book their next tour. They're not going to ask you to come and help direct their next movie. They, could care, they couldn't care less about you. But the God of the universe loves you so much that he wanted to be with you for eternity and made a way for that to happen and allows you to participate in the fulfillment of his plan. That's incredible. Bottom line is you can have your celebrities. I'll take Jesus. Bottom line is that whole harvest the whole harvest 
belongs to God and is overseen by God. He is the God of the harvest. And he has the power to send laborers. Jesus says, go to the one. Go to the source. Go to the one that can fix it. Send laborers. And then look at what he does. Verse chapter 10. It says, and he called to him. Now listen, who did he say to pray to? Who was he talking to? It tells us. Didn't it say his disciples? Right? Look, let's back up and read it. Then he said, this is verse 37, to his disciples. That's who he's talking to. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. And then what, he did, what does he do? And he called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. The names of the 12 apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. Did you, did you catch that for just right there real quick? I know, you might have missed it. What book are we reading? The book of Matthew. Matthew's the one that put pen to paper, recorded this for us. And why does he call himself? The tax collector. Why would he remind us? of that despicable position that he used to hold. I'm going to tell you why. Because he don't forget what Jesus brought him out of. Isn't that powerful? I mean, that little tiny blip, you just would have missed it. You didn't even think about it. Stop and look at what God's word says. Matthew, the tax collector. Did you also notice that these are listed in pairs? These are listed in pairs. Let's start it again. It says, and he called to him, to him his 12 disciples, and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. The names of the 12 apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. Semicolon. In other words, next pair, right? James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Right? So who did he call to do the work, to be the laborers? The same ones he told to pray for laborers. Amen? What does that tell us? Listen, I'm going to tell you something. If we just talk about Penrose Baptist Church, plenty of work to do. Amen? Plenty of work to do. And when we talk about work, you know, the, you know, the, the church, the, the, the five functions, I just shared this on Wednesday with uh, the leadership team. The, the, there's, there's five things we got to be doing as the body of Christ, right? I'm going to tell you what they are after I wet my whistler. This segment sponsored by Diet Mountain Dew. Just kidding. Those five things are, I'll forget one, watch me, worship. That is what we are supposed to be doing as the body of Christ, is worshiping God, amen? Right? And worship shows up in different forms. A lot of people think that worship is just when we sing. It's definitely not. That's not all, all that worship. Because if that were the case, then I could worship better than a lot of people. I'm a singer. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? But God don't even care about that. Amen? What he cares about is this. You can be the best singer in the world with a wicked heart. God ain't blessing it. It ain't for him. You know what I mean? I mean, bottom line is, I've heard some fantastic singers in, in my lifetime. I've heard some fantastic singers that didn't want anything to do with Jesus. Right? So what they're doing is worship too. But they they got an idol. They got something they put in front of God. Likely themselves, amen? Right. So worship encompasses a lot of things. Fellowship, which is the next thing, is worship. When we fellowship with one another, right? And sometimes people think fellowship is just hanging out. It's not just hanging out. Part, that's part of hang, hanging out's part of it, right? Getting to know one another. But it, fellowship carries the connotation of, of teaming up for a goal. 
It has that connotation that, like, we don't just get together just to hang out. We get together and hang out because we love the Lord and each other, right? Fellowship. The next thing is, and another act of worship, is discipleship, right? In order for you to become, go from milk, like on, on milk, a baby Christian, to the meat, somebody who's walking consistently with the Lord and been through trials and, you know, proven in battle and all that kind of thing, then there are some things that have to happen, like information transfer. you got to know some things about God if you're going to stand the trials. It's called doctrine, and you need sound doctrine. Amen? Well, how do you get to know doctrine? People ask me this question. I'm going to tell you, there's a couple of ways. You can hear somebody teach it to you. Somebody can go through the Word and teach it to you, or you can go through the Word by yourself and teach it, and the Spirit will teach you. Right? Right? Notice the, the one thing that's in common, the word. Amen? If you think you can be a Christian, have sound doctrine, and not know God's word, then I can assure you, you don't have sound doctrine. You can't have sound doctrine apart from God's word. That's where we find it, and you've got to get to know that. That happens through a teacher, through doing life together, through learning together. It's called discipleship, which is worship. Amen? The other thing is ministry, serving other people, right? That's a big deal, and it's an act of worship. Some people need certain things at certain times. Some people have, you know, surgeries or whatever, go to the hospital. They can't cook for their family for the following week. We get together and we provide them meals. That's what we, one of the things that we do. We try to, amen? We try to do that, try to take care of folks. When people die and the family's grieving, I don't want them to have to worry about things like, you know, having to pay for a venue to have a funeral. So we open up the church. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be completely honest with you, I don't, the only time I've ever told anybody no was when there was a conflict in scheduling. That's the only time. Anybody that calls, they call off the streets. Yeah, you can have it here. I only have one requirement. The requirement's simple. And that is that somebody preaches the gospel of Jesus. You don't even have to be me, right? But somebody's got to. Right? So we do that. I've never charged anybody for a wedding or a funeral, ever. Not me, not for the church. I mean, for the church, we have to rent the space. For a wedding, funerals, no. Right? So we try to take care of people. Ministry is part of worship. We worship when we, when we help other people. And the, and the last one is evangelism. When you tell other people about Jesus, the lost, about this hope that we have, that's also worship. Amen? That's a lot of work. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you expect your pastor to do it all, you got the wrong dude. You got the, you're going to be disappointed. I mean, that's all there is to it. You're going to be disappointed. I can't do it all. Not, not, not on your behalf. I mean, I'm going to do as much as I can, you know, in my worship to God, Right? But you can't expect one pastor to do all of, the, all of it that happens in the church. So we got to come together. The laborers are few, but the harvest is plentiful. People need Jesus. Right now, they need Jesus. They always have. But right now, we're living in a time people sit and they talk about how bad the times are, and they are getting rougher every single day. But I'm going to tell you something that's growing, and that is the available harvest. The more non-believers there are, the more targets we have. With, for the gospel, amen? So what does he say? He says, pray for laborers. But the person, he, the people he tells to pray for laborers, then he says, you're the laborers. Pray for laborers as you labor. Amen? That's what, that's what we get from this. Now, when he said to pray for laborers, I don't think he was just talking to the 12, but then he calls the 12 and names them out specifically. And what he, the disciples have been watching, if you followed Jesus' ministry up until now and, and, and this, you know, series or whatever you want to call it, then one thing that we see is that up until now, Jesus has been doing all the big works, right? He's the one calming storms. He's the one healing folks. He's the one casting out demons. He's doing all that kind of stuff. But now starts a new phase in his discipleship of his disciples, that's redundant, isn't it? The discipleship of his disciples and the teaching of his disciples. First of all, it was watch me. 
as I do this. Now is you do this while I am with you. Amen? So there's a transition that's taking place. He gives them authority to do the things that he's been doing, to do the work. But they're going to be doing it with his oversight. Right here are the things that he says. I told you all it was going to be a long day, so settle in. We got the Bible here. He gives, look at what it says after that. It says after, uh, where was it? I've lost my place. I'll find it in just half a second. Okay, we gave up on, we stopped on verse 4. Verse 5 is where we're at. It says, these 12 Jesus sent out instructing them. He gives them some instructions. So here's his oversight. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans. If you know the story, then you know why he did this. Because later on, big stuff happens with those people. Amen? If you, ha- if you don't know what I'm talking about, read the book of Acts. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Verse 7, and proclaim as you go. In other words, preach as you go, right? Proclaim as you go, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You received without pay, give without pay. So in other words, you didn't pay me for this authority. You didn't spend money on it. Don't be asking other people, you know, whoa, hold on just a second. I see on TV all the time these dudes that are saying they're healing people, and they, they, they ask for money all the time. Yeah, I, I, can, I can just imagine, out of this group, out of the 12, which one would be the one saying, hey, Lord, can't we just ask him for a little seed money? Judas, right, the one that betrayed him. Why? Because the scripture even tells us that he went, his, one of his jobs was to hold the purse, and he stole out of the purse because he was never regenerated in Christ. He's, a, he's, he's, he's there going through the motions. That's what he's doing. Amen? Can you imagine having all that authority, Jesus there giving, he'll give you the authority. Judas is the one out of the group that would be asking for the money. And yet you got these televangelists, you got these people on TV knocking people in the head and all that kind of stuff, doing these faith healings. And some of you guys have even bought into their nonsense. And I understand, I get it, because they are very convincing at times. But the bottom line is, if they start asking for money and stuff, you know that, what did Jesus say? He said, you didn't pay for it, don't ask for money. Isn't that what he said? We just read it together, right? That's not of God. Just send me, you know, $100. If you just sow $100, you'll see 1000 in your bank account. He'll give it to you tenfold because that's what it said. The stuff that I see, I saw a guy the other day talking about how, listen, in, in Proverbs it says, the blessings of God make me rich, right? And he literally interpreted that as money. Like the blessings of God make me a wealthy person. And so he tried to use that in his prosperity gospel nonsense. Like literally just twisting the word of God to where it doesn't even mean what it actually means. It's so grotesque and despicable. It's straight from the pits of hell, and I don't know how else to describe it. And proclaim as you go, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without paying, give without pay. Acquire no gold or silver or copper for your belt. No bag for your journey. Or two tunics or sandals or a staff for the laborers deserve his food. In other words, don't take anything with you. Do the work God provides. Minister to folks and they'll minister to you. Right? Keep reading. And whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it and stay there until you depart. In other words, minister to them, they'll minister to you. You also notice that back in the listing of the disciples that Peter's always listed first and Judas is always listed last. I just want to throw that out there. Listen, the work that God has given them to do, the authority to heal the, the, the sick and cast out demons, all that stuff. All of that authenticates the word that they're speaking, that they're preaching. That's the purpose of the works is to authenticate the word, is to say this is real. 
what I'm teaching you is the truth. Otherwise, how did that blind man see? Right? Or that deaf man hear? Jesus tells him to stay away from the Gentiles and the Samaritan towns because he's got other plans for them. But instead, preach the gospel and heal the sick. When he says, don't acquire for yourself extra tunics or, you know, shoes and staff and all that kind of stuff. And if you read the other gospels, one of them tells you that they were allowed to take a staff and the other one says that they're not allowed to take a staff. Matthew clears it up because, you know, that's kind of confusing. It looks like a contradiction. Matthew clears up the contradiction. In other words, if you have one, you can take it, but don't acquire one. See what I'm saying? Because that's what he said, don't acquire these things for yourself. Right? In other words, don't make big elaborate plans. Don't, 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 this isn't a business venture. Amen? It's not a business venture. If you're here so that, you know, because you're, you're, you're poor and, and you don't have money in your bank account, I'm not, here, I'm not going to promise you that you're going to get money in your bank account if you give your life to Jesus. What I am going to promise you is that if you truly give your life to Christ, you won't die and go to hell. What's more important? That bank account's temporary. Amen? Thank God it's temporary. Thank God that my bank account is temporary. I'm broke. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. A whole lot of other broke folks here. But listen, I'm rich in Christ. Why? Because his blessings have made me rich. I don't know how that's hard to understand for people. This ain't a business adventure. The last thing that I want you to see, especially when you go out to do the work, is that some will receive it and some won't. That's just the way it is. Right? That's just the way it is. It says, uh, proclaim as you go, verse 7, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You receive without paying, give without pay. Acquire no gold or silver or copper for your belts, no bag for your journey or two tunics or sandals or a staff for the laborer deserves his food. And whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy. What does that mean, who is worthy? He who receives them. Whoever receives it's worthy, amen? Jesus makes us worthy. I saw a post today, somebody talking about how you got to be perfect as your Father in heaven's perfect, which means you'll be without sin and all this other kind of stuff. My Bible tells me that Jesus' righteousness is counted toward me. That's what my Bible tells me. So I am perfect in Christ. Praise God. And whoever's willing to receive that, they're worthy. And if you're not willing to receive it, then you're not. Seems pretty simple, doesn't it? And whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it and stay there until you depart. As you enter the house, greet it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly, I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. So in other words, don't linger where you're not wanted. If they don't, if they don't want to receive it, then they don't receive it. Shake the dust off your feet, go to the next place. Amen? I think a lot of times we linger too, far, too long where it's not wanted. That doesn't mean you don't come back to it later date. Don't mean that God won't send somebody else. You know what I mean? We put way too much, much uh, weight on our work. I'm going to tell you something. Salvation is not of you. It's of God. Right? Sanctification is not of you. It is of God. Glorification is not of you. It is of God. It's all God's. I think I covered all that. Here's the thing, though. So, Jesus is ministering to these folks. He's healing people. It's authenticating. It's, it's showing them that the word is real, that this gospel is truth. Because of the works that he's doing. Will you pay attention just for half a second? Because this is why we're here today. He's doing the work and he looks out and he sees the crowds and how they're being ravaged by the people who are swirling. The sharks, the wolves, the lions are swirling around. And he says, 
pray for laborers because laborers are few. The harvest is plentiful. There's a, there's a crowd who need Jesus. And listen, all you have to do is walk out this door. You're going to see a crowd that needs Jesus. When you go to work, there's a crowd that needs Jesus. When you go to kids' functions, there's a crowd that needs Jesus. When you go to sporting events, there's a crowd that needs Jesus. They're everywhere, amen? All it takes is laborers. Yeah? And the Spirit of God, and God uses those labors, and, and he allows us to participate in the fulfillment of his plan. Listen, he tells them to pray, and then he commissions them to go do the work. I got news for you. If you've given your life to Christ, then he's commissioned you too. He's commissioned you too. It's actually called the Great Commission. What did he say? He said that you got to go. You got to give them the gospel, Right? You got to go and you got to give them the gospel. You got to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them all that He commanded us. That's what, that's what we got to do. We got to disciple them. We got to make disciples. That's what He told us to do. You're like, yeah, Josh, but when He was there, He gave them authority to cast out demons and all that kind of stuff, and He hasn't given me that authority. You're right. I don't know that He's given me that authority. I don't think that He has or whatever, but it does say, I will be with you even until the end of the age. So even if you don't have the authority to cast out demons and heal sick and all that kind of stuff, he does, and if you have him, then he's in you. Am I telling you to go out and start casting out demons and all that kind of stuff? No. That's not what I'm saying. If you get into that kind of thing, you better make sure that the Lord is leading you. Because if not, you start toying with stuff that eats you alive. Right? I'm saying that he has authority. I ain't scared of it. Because he's with me, amen? I got a phone call a while back. I've shared this story with some folks. I had a friend call and say that they needed me to come because there was a girl that was possessed by demons. And I, I went and I talked to this girl. It turned out she wasn't demon-possessed, but she was certainly demon-oppressed. A lot of times demons do their work from the outside and just wear you out. And she was wore out. You could see it all over her face. And I'm telling you, it was the craziest thing. I, I, I sent out messages to the elders of the church at that time, and I said, I need you guys to pray for me. Here's what I'm walking into, and I just need you to pray. And it's the weirdest thing, and it sounds like totally irrational, and I don't care <laughs> that it sounds irrational because it's the truth. It's like I could feel their prayers. Weird. But I'm telling you, it's the truth. It's like I could feel them praying for me. And I, like I, it was weird. You're like, Josh, I know you're a pretty rational dude. And, you know, I am. I'm like Thomas, you know, he was mentioned there, the skeptic, the one that's got to be shown everything, Josh Clifford. I'm still passionate like Peter, but I got that skeptic side of me, you know. And so as I'm going down to this place, I feel, I, I, I just know that they're praying for me. I can feel it. Like I can feel their prayers. I don't know how to explain it. I get there and I'm praying to the Lord the whole time that I'm going down there, Lord, whatever it is that she needs, give it to me so I can give it to her, whatever it is. Give it to me so I can give it to her. If it's, if it's words, then give me the words. Whatever it is, give it to me so I can give it to her. And I'm praying that, and I go, and I go in this room, and she's sitting on this couch, and the, the two ladies are sitting beside her, and they're in tears, and she's in tears, and her countenance is the, the lowest countenance in a person that I've ever seen in my entire life, and she ain't but about 17 years old. Hadn't showered in days. I mean, just drab countenance. I don't, I've never seen anything like it before, and I've never seen anything like it since, to be honest with you. And I sat down behind the desk, and I'm going to tell you that I can talk a big game, but in that moment, I was looking for like a letter opener or something that if she was demon-possessed, come across the table at me, I could defend myself. I'm serious. That's what I was thinking about. I'm <laughs> sorry, you know, just being honest with you. And as she's sitting there, and they're, they're talking this Christianese, you know, telling them, you just got to give it to Jesus. You know, you just get, people, some people don't even know what that means. Most people I have found don't even know what that means. Most Christians don't even really know what it means. You know what I'm saying? And they're telling this girl that because that's what they know. They're doing all they can and God bless them for it, right? And they look at me and they say, do you want us to leave the room or you want to stay here? I say, yeah, I want you to leave the room. 
I never do that, especially with a woman and especially a teenage woman. This case was a rare occasion that the room was lined with windows all the way around, and they were just on the other side of the open windows. You could see everything that happened. So I knew it would be okay. And so as they exited the room, she's sitting there, and she's never looked at me. From the time I walked in until this moment, she's never looked at me. And she's sitting there, and she's crying. She's still not looking at me. Her head's down. And I asked her, I said, why aren't you happy? And that was the first time she looked at me. She looked at me under her, her hair like this. Hair's coming down here. And she looked at me through her hair, and she kind of smiled. And she said, because he's not happy. And I said, well, who's he? And she said, the devil. And he doesn't like you. And I said, good, we're on the same page. <laughs> it's mild. And I'm going to tell you something, and this is the craziest thing. I can't fully explain it because sometimes you just got to experience stuff, you know what I'm saying, to know what even happened. And I'm, I get every time I even start talking about it, the hairs on my arms fill up. And I'm telling you, I'm not basing anything doctrinally on the hairs of my arms, right? But this is what I am going to tell you, that in that moment, God was in the room. He was there. And I could feel his presence, weirdest thing. I know some of y'all are like, you never talk like this. I know, which makes it all the more interesting and, and, you know, gives it a little more veracity to know that I don't talk in these kind of terms, but I could feel the presence of God in that room. And I knew in that moment, listen, I knew in that moment. It's not that I just thought in that moment. I knew in that moment if what I needed and what she needed in that moment was for me to fly, I could probably fly. I wasn't going to test it, but I'm just saying. Whatever I needed in that moment, God was there to provide himself in the room. And it wasn't just that he was in the room. It was that he was in me, in the room. And I knew in that moment what she needed as we're talking. It became blatantly obvious. And that was I knew that if I laid on my hands on her, I laid my hand on her, and I prayed for her, that God was going to deal with whatever was there. Felt it. I knew it. In the craziest way, I, I, and it's never happened since, being completely honest with you. Never happened before like that. But I knew in that moment God was going to have his way with her. And I said, can I pray with you? And as I did, her dad burst through the door, grabbed her arm, carried her out. I never got to pray with her. Now, that's the truth. I'm just being honest with you. That's what happened. She was late for an appointment, literally dragged her out. Didn't even, no, no time to even say, hey, hold, hold on, just, just one second. Nothing. You know what I mean? So what, why am I telling you that? This is what I'm telling you. I'm telling you that whatever, if God sends you on a mission, he gives you a commission to go and do what he wants you to do, and you go and do the thing, whatever you need, he'll provide. He'll provide you with the words. He'll provide you with the works. He'll provide you with whatever Whatever it takes to fulfill his, 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 his plan. And he's inviting you to participate in it. Amen? That's huge. So here's my thing, Christian. If we have that commission from God, if he tells us that we need more laborers, why are we sitting around in this comfortable room with our hand, with our, with sitting on our hands? Why are we stuck? Why are we stuck doing things that make us feel good like we're serving the Lord, but not necessarily really serving the Lord? Why are we not going and telling the people that are around us that are dying and going to hell about this hope that we allegedly have within us? Why are we so silent? Why are we the frozen chosen? And I'm not talking about the temperature. If you have this spirit in you, then you have to be motivated to go. You have to. Pray for laborers as you labor. And for those of you who haven't given your life to Christ, then listen, I'm going to tell you something. All that I said is true. You are dying and going to hell apart from Christ. But he'll forgive your sin. He'll give you eternal life. Not just eternal life, but life more abundantly if you give your life to him. If you trust him as the payment of your sin and turn it over to him. Stop sitting on your hands. Stop putting stuff in front of God. Right? Stop that. And do the work as we pray for more laborers. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, I thank you for this word. It's so convicting to me, and I pray that it, I, I know that it probably is for others. That I always, I just, anytime I come across it, I know that I'm not doing enough for your kingdom. Lord, and I pray that you forgive me for that. I spend so much time toiling in things that are not eternal, and for that, it, it's very convicting. Lord, I pray that you would do something with that conviction. Lord, that you would give me a heart of repentance. Lord, that you would forgive me of those things and I would turn away from them. And Lord, I know that other people here are feeling the same kind of conviction. Lord, I pray that you would give them a heart of repentance because repentance is a gift from you. It is also your work. So Lord, I pray that we would repent, the ones who have given our lives to you, and that we would do the work. And for those that are here, that are within earshot of my voice, that are not, that are not, given their lives to you. They haven't given their lives to you. Lord, I pray that you would use this seed that's been planted. I pray that you would water it, Lord. I pray that it would grow and that they would give their lives to you without delay. Because there's no such thing as loneliness when we're in your kingdom. You're always with us. You never leave us or forsake us. We can't be singled out by the devil, separated and devoured because you're with us. And Lord, whatever it is that we need to accomplish the task that you've given us, Lord, you provide. So I pray, Lord, that we would, without fear of the world, but fear of you, that we would go out and give that gospel, that hope to the ones who are dying and going to hell. I pray, Lord, that we would not toil with things that are not eternal. Not waste time on those things, but Lord, that we would spend our time leading people to you and enjoying this abundant life you've given us. We ask this in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Amen. If you want to give your life to the Lord, you can do it right now. Talk to him. Talk to him. Repent of your sin. If you've got questions about it that you need answered, come up here. Sit right next to me. We'll sit here and we'll talk it out until you're satisfied. But let's stand and sing as we do. You are sure.